It is phenomenal to see how one great teacher can change the entire direction of someone's life. The first example that comes to my mind is of a physicist, Stephen Hawking, who actually went to school a couple of miles away from where I live, in a small town of St. Albans, just north of London. At the time, Stephen Hawking wasn't interested in maths or physics, but there he met his teacher, De Grand Dachte, who ignited that spark of curiosity in Stephen Hawking which later made him one of the greatest physicists of our time. In fact, when de Grand Tachte died, Stephen Hawking dedicated a beautiful speech to his former teacher, thanking him for everything that he had done for him. We can only speculate what would happen if de Grand Tachte and Stephen Hawking would never meet. We might, we could have lost one of the greatest physicists of our time. Beautiful books, such as Brief History of Time, would have never been written. This subject of why there are so many bad teachers and what makes a good teacher uh, always interested me. In this video I would like to tell you a personal tale of two teachers. One a bad one who tried to kill curiosity in his students and unfortunately succeeded. And the other one is a teacher that I met accidentally in one of the art galleries in Russia when I was a teenager. She ignited curiosity which stays with me until today. I believe that every bad teacher is different in their own way, while there are some traits that unite all good teachers together. I always enjoyed learning, but I never quite liked being taught. And my teacher at the Russian school, whose name was Alexei Alexandrovich, was kind of a person who liked being this strict teacher. Every couple of months, Russian schools take their students to those cultural trips, to classical music concerts, to theater plays, to museums, art galleries. And every trip with Alexei Alexandrovich to an art gallery was slowly becoming a weird theater play because his behavior used to change the moment we entered the art galleries. His voice was becoming more louder than usual, even his pitch and intonation was changing. He had the habit of stopping at the leaflet stands and right next to the entrance of the art galleries. He used to pick up a leaflet advertising a recent exhibition and the purpose of picking up the leaflet was to tell us that 20 years ago he curated some kind of magical exceptional uh, art exhibition that changed the course of art history. It's been 20 years and I still try to find any slight evidence that that exhibition ever existed. And I remember during one of those school trips to Tritikov Art Gallery, which stores masterpieces of Russian art, Alexei Alexandrovich used to stop in front of the paintings and throw random facts to us. That this painting was created in 1830s, the artist was born in 1790 something. All the facts that us teenagers couldn't care less and couldn't remember. The worst part was that Alexei Alexandrovich used to spend approximately 15 to 20 seconds per painting. Yes, 15 to 20 seconds. We spend more time on Instagram or TikTok posts sometimes than Alexei Alexandrovich used to spend on masterpieces of Russian art. And you can imagine that in 10 minutes he could pass 20 paintings. And by the time you reach the 20th painting, you couldn't remember what was the first painting. And of course, as a teenager, I couldn't care less about those paintings that were created 200 years ago had no connection to my life so I tried to sneak out from the group at the most convenient moment and I knew that I had approximately 30 to 40 minutes to come back to the group before he notices me. For 30 minutes I was a teenager who was completely free who could do whatever he wants but I was stuck in an art gallery. So the only place I could go was the canteen of the museum to buy some soda, get some sweets and listen to my CD player. And as I was looking for the signs that would direct me towards the canteen, in one of those rooms I noticed a painting that 
captured my attention so much that I just stood like a marble statue in front of it. The surprising thing about this painting was that it didn't depict any action scene. There was no Greek uh, gods battling each other, there were no nudes, nothing that would capture the attention of a teenager at the time. As I will show, it just depicted some sea and the sky and a small ship that was sailing away. And for a moment, I lost every sense of time. I forgot where I was. I was just staring at this painting. And as I stood and got absorbed into this painting and I started to pay attention to the dark waves of the sea and the sky that was turning from gray to bright, staring at that ship that sailed far away, I, I could start suddenly feel footsteps coming from my right side. And I could see that it was a woman that was wearing a blue dress with a dark framed glasses and a gallery badge hanging around her neck, approaching me. I was afraid that she's going to scold me, ask me where is my school trip, why am I away from them? But instead, she just said, don't get distracted. And she just stood right next to me and started looking at the painting with me. She asked me, what do you see in it? And of course, I found it slightly strange and I was a bit shaken. I told her the first thing that came to my mind. I said that I can feel as if something happened in this painting, perhaps a storm. She asked me, why do I think that storm had already happened and not the other way? And I said that the colors of the waves and of the sky on the left side of the painting are much darker and the sea seems to be coming down further right we look at it. She took her badge that was uh, hanging around her neck, she tossed it back, leaned towards the painting and started examining all the colors and she said, I think you might be right. In fact, the clue might be in the title of this painting because this painting was created by Ivan Ivazovsky and it's called Black Sea. When Ivazovsky just painted it, he called it the storm at the sea. She asked me, what else do I see in this painting? It was so strange to be asked this question because none of my teachers ever asked my own opinion about something. If they ever asked questions, they were about facts. When was this painting painted? Give me the date. When was this artist born? Useless facts that you can look up. This person was asking me to think. And I think at that moment, I completely lost track of time. I completely forgot that Alexei Alexandrovich can pop around the corner any moment and, and see that I'm away from the group. But to be honest, I couldn't care less. I said that I believe that this painting has kind of a metaphysical story. It, it is as if it tells a story of our life. And I kind of turned my head because I was very un unconfident. She looked at me with a sight as if asking me to continue. And I said, perhaps this painting tells the story of our own life. And the ship that we see in the distance is us sailing away towards the god represented by the sun. And the storms that are depicted on the left side of the painting is the story of our lives, of how when we are young, we have very stormy, turbulent life. And as it, we reach towards its end, it gets brighter, we are getting closer to God. And, and then I shut my mouth because I couldn't believe what I'm saying. She looked at me and asked, how old are you, 15? I said, no, 13. She said, it's quite deep and very philosophical for her 13 year old, um, smiling. And she told me that I might be right because this painting was created in 1881 when Ivazovsky was quite old in his life. And of course, I didn't know all those facts and she was telling me. She told me that Ivazovsky was married to a woman that he didn't particularly love and she made his life miserable. Towards the end of his life, he found a woman whose name was Anna Pulzanyan, and she became his second wife, and they lived happily ever after, as in a fairy tale. And then she asked me a question. She said, can I ask you, where are you originally from? Although I grew up in Russia, I'm quite a dark looking guy. And I said, I'm originally Armenian. And she said, 
Did you do you know that um, Ivazovsky's real name is Hovanes Ivazan, which is Armenian name? She kind of smiled and laughed and she said, I know that Armenians love facts like this. We kind of both smiled together because yes, Armenians do like finding other Armenians. And it was at this moment that I could hear the voice of dreadful, boring Alexei Alexandrovich entering the room with the rest of my class. And he saw me standing with this woman and his usual pale face suddenly turned red. He approached us and he said, I hope he is not causing too, too much trouble. And she said, no, no, we were just standing and discussing this painting. He was sharing his opinion and I could sense that his ego is wounded, that somebody like whoever she is, is challenging his authority in art. But he remained polite and he was like, can I ask you, do you work here? And suddenly she remembered that she had her badge uh, tossed on her back so he couldn't see it. So she brought the badge back to the front and he leaned towards it to read who she is and it turned out that she's one of the top curators, best curators in Russia, who curated multiple exhibitions in Moscow and St. Petersburg. And suddenly he started melting in front of her and, and saying how much he appreciates her work. Although she, she could understand that perhaps he doesn't know anything about her work. Just after several seconds of him um, groveling and praising her, she asked us to wait and said that she will be back in literally a minute. And it was was a really awkward minute me standing next to my teacher who was like all red but he didn't utter a single word and she came back quite quickly and she was holding something that resembled a catalog in her hands. At first Alexei Alexandrovich thought that she's bringing this to him but she approached to me instead and it was a catalog of Ivazovsky's works. She handed it to me and she said this is a catalog of Ivazovsky's works that I curated. I think you'll spend a lot of time browsing it and I hope it will help you in your curiosity. She told me that she hopes that art will always be with me and that it will always nourish my life and uh, thanked me and thanked my teacher and turned around and went back to whatever she was doing before seeing me. On that day I realized the difference and what distinguishes a bad teacher from a good teacher. A bad teacher tells us facts. A good teacher awakens our curiosity. Um, a good teacher is very passionate about the subject that they are teaching. They cannot live without it and they always look for people who are as curious as they are. So that lovely lady who approached me, she was really genuinely curious about art. She dedicated her entire life interpreting, studying, doing research about art. People like that are very unique and they always look for companionship. They look for people who are as interested and it is quite rare and difficult to find. I believe that one of the reasons why she approached me and came and asked all those questions was because she could see that I am standing in front of that painting and I'm so absurd that I lost the track of time. And she's so kind of a person with whom she could discuss what she really enjoys. But there's something else that makes someone a bad teacher. It's not only lacking a curiosity in the subject that you are teaching, but it is also being afraid that a student might challenge you. When you spark a curiosity in someone, you automatically make him or her independent. And that's what bad teachers are afraid of. Because the moment when students become curious, they also become independent. They can find all those random facts that Alexei Alexandrovich was throwing at us in any other encyclopedia. You don't need a, a human teacher for this. And that's what bad teachers are most afraid of. They are afraid that their students will realize that they don't need them. While well, like that lovely lady, they are seeking for companions with whom they can test their ideas. They are not afraid to be 
less knowledgeable than their students, although it will take many years for someone like me to be remotely equal to her in the amount of knowledge and insight that she had. Today I read the story of Tigran Tacht and Stephen Hawking. It made me remember this lovely lady who I met in Tritikov Gallery in Moscow. It made me understand that although Tigran Tacht taught physics in England and this lady works as a gallery curator in Moscow, there is something unites them together and that makes them good teachers. It is their passion for what they do. It is their desire to awaken curiosity in their students. It's their understanding that facts cannot can be read by anyone, but not everyone has this relentless, ardent curiosity in, in a subject. If you want your child to read, you should read yourself. You can tell your child every day of every week of every month how important it is to read. But if you don't read yourself, if your child doesn't see you in the process of reading, all of these lectures of saying that reading is important is going to is not going to have impact on them. The best way to prevent your child from smoking is not to smoke yourself. The best way to teach someone to be passionate about something is to be passionate yourself. Alexei Alexandrovich read, wrote, taught art for 25 years, but he didn't understand anything in art because he wasn't passionate about it. He was more busy of stroking his own ego, of being this loud actor instead of being really passionate and loving art. I would really love if you could share your stories of good and bad teachers in the comments. As I said, it is one of the subjects that um, really interests me and I would really love to hear uh, some of the stories from you. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you in the next one.